Okay, guys, uh, hopefully you've got this down. We're going to be in Galatians 3, Hebrews 10, 2 Peter chapter 1. You can also uh, text notes to the number that's on the screen. It pops up every now and then, and you can text notes to that number, get, get the notes of my message right now. Talking about covenant. Covenant is an agreement between two parties where both parties both parties agree to do something in the covenant. God has made a covenant to provide for us in this life and into eternal life. And what you need to know is God's covenant takes care of you forever and ever and ever. God is here to provide for you. And as we go further and deeper into this covenant, you need to understand that man is to submit to the covenant of God. We're going to find out a little bit more about the covenant, but there is a part you played. There's a part that we play. There's a part we do in this covenant. You know, like if you, I'd like you to think about a covenant being an agreement, like a contract. And if you were going to go get a, con, and you're going to go buy something on contract, on your credit card or on a, on a loan, you are agreeing to make those payments. You are, in a credit card, you have agreed to make the minimum payment, which is really not the best way to live. But with, in, let's say you bought a house. Let's say you bought a condo. Let's say you bought a car. And you went out and you got a contract, and you have a contract between the bank and you or the finance company and you, and you put your name on that, and you're saying, I will make these payments for the, next, for the length of this contract. And now you are supposed to make the payments. And if you make the payments, the bank doesn't take the car away. You get to keep using the car because you're making the payments. And once the car is all paid off, it belongs to you. You can turn around and do something, whether you could sell it, keep it, whatever you want. But there is a part you play. It is the same in the covenant with God. There is a part that we play. And whether you like it or not, we are supposed to follow him, not him follow us. There are a whole lot of Christians that ask God to follow them around and be there when they are in need when he has asked us, according to the covenant, to follow him. And it's a big difference having God somewhere close by, like, God, be here when I need you, versus, God, where do you need me? And there's a two different mindsets. The other thing we're supposed to do is do his will. We should be submitting to the will of God, and we should be worshiping him. We are here to worship God. We are here to do the will of God. We are here to follow him. Now, every covenant has a blessing and a cursing. And I shared, with this, I shared this in detail last week. Every covenant, and it's worldwide, and it doesn't matter what nationality, what tribe, what group of people, there are contracts, there are agreements, there are covenants, and they've been around since Adam and Eve. And every covenant has blessings and cursings. And if you will go back even in the Old Testament and you will hear about God making a covenant through Moses with the people of Israel, that half the people got on one mountain, half the people got on another mountain, half the people said amen to the curses, half the people said amen to the blessings, and the blessings and cursings were declared. You can find this in Deuteronomy. And you'll, you'll find out that there were blessings if you keep the covenant and cursings if you don't. But what's amazing, absolutely amazing about the covenant that we are, according to Galatians chapter 3, I ask you to be there. So open up your Bibles, look in your Bibles, Galatians chapter 3. In verse 13, Christ has redeemed us, bought us back, bought us from, taken us out from the curse of the law having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hanged on a tree. So according to this Bible verse, which I think is an extremely important Bible verse and should be marked in your Bible or in your electronic device somehow by highlighting it, what this is saying is Jesus Christ paid the price for the curse. There is cursings and blessings on every covenant, but Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. But listen, really close. The curse is still here. It hasn't been removed. You have been given a place in the kingdom of God to overcome the curse, not be, uh, you are still exposed to the curse. You are not living outside the curse, but you get to live blessed inside the curse. And here's what I mean by that. According to verse 14, that the blessing, now Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, that the blessing of Abraham, blessing of Abraham, what's really absolutely amazing is there are so many people who want to live under the law, which is the blessing of Moses, 
when God has called us to live under the blessing of Abraham over 400 years before the law. And what you need to understand is that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles uh, through in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. There are a couple of key words. The first one is the word blessing, and the next one is the word promise. God wants you to have the blessing of Abraham, and he wants you to have the promise of the Spirit. But there's a one little word in here that most people don't even look at. Just read right over. Assume it's not even there. Most people think, according to this verse, most people think, according to verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, therefore they never face the curse. They never have the curse. The curse is never there. And that's wrong. And it says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, that we, we might receive the promise. What I'm saying is, it's up to you whether you get the promise and the blessing. God has provided it, but you have to use faith. You have to believe that it's for you. You have to overcome the curse of the law by knowing that you have been redeemed by Christ Jesus, and you have to exercise your faith so that you would receive the blessing. The blessing is available, but the curse is still in the land. And there are a lot of Christians living under the curse when they should be redeemed from the curse and live in the blessing. But you're going to have to take the promises of God, exercise the promises of God that you receive the blessing and not live in the curse. Now, in verse 15, same chapter, brethren, I speak in a manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or, or adds to it, which simply saying, if there is a legal contract between two people, a bank and you, there's no one else that can come in and annul it. Both parties have to agree it's over. Both parties have to give in. Like if you want to get out of the contract, the other person you're in the contract with has to release you. And that's simply, that's all it's saying that gets to verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, and I think this is extremely important. He doesn't say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. Last week I talked to you. In fact, Pastor Josh entered it, introduced it on Easter Sunday. He talked about the animals that were split in half and, the, and the, the smoke and the fire going through the animals. And the last week I shared a little bit about that and what the covenant was, what the animals being cut open. And what, it, what you need to understand is that fire and that smoke, that oven and that torch that went through there were God the Father and Christ the Son. The father said, I can't make a promise or a covenant with man. He will always break it. And it proved it by giving the law to Moses, where man broke it all the time. He said, I can't trust you to keep it. You won't keep it. You will always fail. So guess what? I won't keep it with you. I will make a covenant with my son who will always keep it. The covenant that we live in is not a covenant between you and God, it's a covenant between you, a God, and Jesus. And here's what's really, really important. We get blessed. We get blessed. God is so committed to his promises that he shed the blood of his own son to be the guarantee, and it is by the blood that gives us a covenant with God. It is a blood covenant that we live in. And what you need to understand, we qualify for this covenant because we are in Christ. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, okay, I'm not going to go to 8, eight verse 6 just yet. I want to talk to you uh, just a little bit more. It is a blood covenant where you being in Christ Jesus gives you access to the blessings of the covenant and redemption from the curse of the covenant. You have to know who you are in Jesus Christ. You have to know what God has done for you. So now let's go to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. I asked you to open up Hebrews. I think another, was it chapter 8? Okay, good. Let's jump over there right now and look at this. And it, it, this is extremely important. But now he, being Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator, which is a go-between, the one that's making sure it happens, of a, this is important, better covenant, 
which was established on better promises. We are in a better covenant with better promises. Now I'm going to blow you away with this thought. If there is a promise in the Old Testament, it has to be included in the New Testament or else it wouldn't be a better promises. If there is something good in the old, it's got to be included in the new because we are in a new covenant with better promises. It is a better covenant. So there can't be a blessing that is good for you left out. It can't be something that God has already provided that you don't get, oh, that's not included. Such as the blessing of tithing. Some of you treat tithing as a curse. God treats it as a blessing. God said, in this covenant, I need you to help me spread the word, and I'm asking for your 10%. And it is an honor and a blessing to give that to God. And then there is a blessing added to it. And the blessing that's added to it is that he would multiply and increase in your life through your giving. God then takes that tithing blessing and he increases it in the New Testament. And he wants people in the New Covenant to use tithing as their floor, not their ceiling. He wants them to realize generosity is something important for the kingdom of God. And he's asking for people to give of their selves, of their income, of their earnings, of their own heart, and he will bless. If there is a blessing under the old covenant, like if I give and it will be given unto me, it has to be included in the new plus more. Because we are in a better covenant with better promises. We are living in a better covenant with better promises. Would you say better covenant? Better promises. The promises are better than they was under the old covenant. We are living in something that is extremely important where God is doing something big in us. Then it says in verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second covenant. The covenant has two parties. The a covenant has two parties parties. And what you need to realize is we are included in this covenant because we are in Christ and we have a part of the covenant because we need we need to keep our part. We have a part and we need to keep it. So now I need you, you're in Hebrews chapter 6, go to chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 15, Hebrews 10 verse 15, it says this, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant, this is the covenant, I think this is important, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. In this present season, in this present time, that we live on planet earth waiting for the return of the Lord. Jesus Christ established the church. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus Christ in his sovereign choice decided I would build the kingdom using the church. Not independent individuals, but the church. That would be a work of of the whole body, the church working together, where God wants the church to work together. Jesus, according to Ephesians chapter 4, puts in the church the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the teaching pastor. Puts them in the church. In Ephesians chapter 4, Jesus puts specific offices, individuals, men and women, who are supposed to do one thing. Write the word of God on your minds. So the Holy Spirit will write it in your heart. But yet, we look at this and we think, I don't need a preacher, I don't need a pastor, I don't need an apostle, I don't need an evangelist, because I can read the Bible on my own, 
and the Holy Spirit's going to teach me, and I don't need a teacher, uh, and I will, God will show me. According to the Bible, according to Jesus, according to the Son of God, that's not true. If we didn't need an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, then God, the Son, would not put them in the church. And their specific job is to build you up, to edify you, that you may do ministry. And we are here to write it on your mind so the Holy Spirit will implant it in your heart. Extremely important. Continue in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. I'm doing my Vanna White impression, you know, the best I possibly could. This is life-giving scripture. Why are you remembering your sins when God isn't? Why do you keep reminding God how bad you are when he's not reminding you that you're bad? He keeps reminding you that you're good. Why do you keep holding on to all your mistakes and disqualify yourself from any future blessing because you made a past mistake? Yes, you did. Now wake up and smell the righteousness. And live, live. He's not remembering your sins anymore. Quit reminding him. Now, there, now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. You don't need to keep going back to God and asking Christ to die on the cross again for your sins. He did it once and for all. You need to accept the blessing of the covenant and the blessing of the covenant is I won't remember. The blessing of the covenant is you are forgiven. The blessing of the covenant is God has washed you. God has cleansed you. God has made you something new. God is taking care of it. That's the blessing of the covenant. Amen. But we need to know when we make a mistake, when we sin, when we flat out do something stupid that I call fleshing out, we come to God and we, we tell him, we're honest. It's not like when you are confessing your sin to God, God, oh, I didn't know you did that. It, it's not that at all. It's coming to saying, the word confession, John, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. The word confess means to say the same thing. That Greek word confess means to say the same thing, not to say something new. We keep going to God trying to say something new, like I did this, I did that. I, and we, we go like we're going into a booth and confessing, and then we're getting assigned our punishment, and then once we do our assignment, we're cleansed. That's not Bible. That's not biblical. What we are supposed to be saying is, what does God say? God, you said that this anger that I just displayed towards another brother in the Lord is wrong. I am now bringing it up to you to say what you say. I need your help in this area of my life. I need you to help me. I submit to the voice of the Holy Spirit as I walk with Christ. Now, in that process, in, in living that, I am saying what he says, and I don't need another remission for sin. I need to take the one that already happened on the cross and accept it. I need to believe in what Jesus did on the cross. Verse 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And everyone knows what the holiest is. You remember the tabernacle of Moses, and it's based off a tabernacle that's already in heaven. And in the tabernacle of Moses, there's an outer court, there's an inner court, and then there's a building. And inside the building, there's only two rooms. In the first room that they enter in, that the priests enter in, is the holy place. And then the back room is the holiest place, the holy of holies. And on the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross, the, the veil was rent from the top to the bottom. Jesus, God the Father, tore that veil to allow us to come into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. This scripture is telling you, you have every legal right to be in the presence of God and not die. You have the right to see God and not die because you're bought with the blood. The blood paid the way. 
Under the old covenant, if you saw God, you would die. Under the old covenant, they were bringing, under the leadership of David, they were bringing the tabernacle. You have to understand, this was pretty funny. I've got to tell you a quick story. Some people took the tabernacle of David and they stole it. And they took it to their homeland. And everybody broke out with hemorrhoids. It's in the Bible. It would be a great movie. And their city got overran with rats. So we had hemorrhoids and rats. And so they took the, the tabernacle to another place. Took it to another place. Another city. And they had hemorrhoids and rats. So they said, what do we do? And they said, let's, let's just put it on a cart and send it to Israel. Get it out of here. Give it back to them. And so what they did is they made little statues, gold statues of rats and hemorrhoids. Truly, you read the Bible. And then they put it on in, in, the, in the ark and they sent it. And it shows up. That, I mean, here's these a couple of oxen, I believe it is, are carrying, carrying the ark, come on in, and it gets to a person's house and now they have it there. And so David wants it in, in the city and he brings all this, he brings people over and they start to come back and they start to sing and dance and stuff. And the ark starts to fall. And this one, I mean, just an innocent guy wants, doesn't want the ark to fall on the ground, puts the ark up and dies because he touched the ark because it's against the law. Now, how come nobody in the other city that were not Jewish people, how come they didn't die when they touched it? Because it wasn't their law. But under the law of Moses, these, this per particular man was not allowed to touch the ark. And he did and died. And so that scared everybody. That would, yeah, that would scare the hemorrhoids out of you too. <laughs> <laughs> so, they, so they moved the ark into a guy's house and it sat there and he just got wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. Um, blessing just poured over from the ark into his family. And David sought and researched to find out how to bring the ark back. Okay, that was just a real, real quick story just to get you to hear by saying, you're not going to die if you touch the ark. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus. You're not going to die. Come into the holy place. Come into his presence. Come into where he, he would like you to be. In fact, every time we gather as a church to worship, whether you're online, whether you're here, because this is the assembly. We are assembled. Some of us are assembled online. Some of us are in this room. And when we worship, we should see ourselves going to the holiest. We should go right to the throne of God. We should see the face of the Father and not be afraid. We shouldn't be thinking, Blue agave, el chorizo. We should be thinking, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. And you know, it takes discipline. It takes discipline to worship. It takes discipline to keep your mind on the thought of God. And that's what God is asking us. Can we be disciplined to do it? Verse 20, by a new, this, this is kind of where I'm at for the whole day by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. God said there's a new veil. The veil is the flesh of Jesus Christ. And the, and the veil was put up on the cross, died for us. The blood was shed to give us the right to enter to the holiest place. But God wants us to live a new and living way. No longer dead sacrifices. No longer animals being sacrificed. The dead sacrifice that paid the price for all is now alive. It's called the resurrection, Jesus Christ. And then we get to verse 21. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Okay, guys, this is a, there's a whole bunch right in here, an, an awful lot. Then we get to verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling 
of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so the more as you see the day approaching. I want to take those verses that we just went through and give you a summary. It is called the new and living way. There are two things that you are supposed to do in this covenant, in the new and living way. Number one, you're supposed to draw near to God. You should be able to draw near to God. He wants you to draw near. Can you say the words draw near? Now, how do you draw near? Having your hearts cleansed from an evil conscience, your bodies washed with pure water, the word of God, and holding fast our confession of hope. These are the things that will cause us to draw near to God. Our hearts cleansed from an evil conscience. Quit remembering your sins and start remembering your righteousness through the blood of Jesus. The more you concentrate on righteousness, the less you will sin. The more you concentrate on faith, the less you will sin. The answer for sinning is faithing. It's a real word. I made it up. The answer for sinning is faithing. If I'm faithing, I'm not sinning. If I'm living in faith, I'm not living in sin. I should concentrate on living in faith. I should, I should mark my faith journeys, not my sin failures. And you do it in your mind. So that's what has to happen. You have to, have a, you have to cleanse yourself from an evil conscience. Your body's washed with pure water, which is the word of God. Taking the word of God and just saying, no, I'm, gonna, I'm going to take my body and have it live according to the Bible. Well, that's really amazing. That was like a super revelation for all of us, wasn't it? <laughs> Holding fast our confession of hope. The second thing that's part of the new and living way, the second one is consider others. Consider others. Stir them up to love and good works, considering others. He wants you to assemble together. Well, today, assembly is, looks a lot different than it did in the writing of the book of Hebrews. Today's assemble an assembling of a church looks very, very different than it did even two years ago. Today's assembly includes people in the house and people watching online. But you are still part of us. Whether you're watching online and you are at home or somewhere else or you're on vacation, you get to assemble. You're not just peeking in on what we're doing. You're part of what we're doing. And while you are there online being part of what we're doing, we are making a difference in all our communities. By standing, holding strong, we assemble ourselves together. We have people in the house, we have people online, but we are all Church of Grace making a difference. And that's important that we continue to assemble. Remember everyone, remind everyone, the day is approaching. The, the day, the phrase the day throughout the New Testament always refers to the day of judgment. It always refers to that day. That the day, the day. And God wants you to remember and remind each other that the day is coming. The day is coming. We should be living for the day that's coming, not living for this day. We should live for the day that's going to be here. God is expecting you to do your part. Now, here's how you can do your part in moving in the new and living way. Hebrews 13. Now, may the God of peace who brought you, brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, everlasting. This is never ending. This is the covenant that takes care of us even in heaven. Make you complete. And I, I really want you to understand this, that he is praying that you will be complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. So the new and living way, the new and living way is for you to draw near to God and for you to be kind to other people, to consider others. That is the commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the new and living way. The new and living way is thinking about other people, being kind to other people, considerate to other people. You need to realize that, you are, that he wants to make you complete. You need to grow up in the Lord. And now here's where the message makes a turn. And it's going to rock your world if we have time to get through it. You need to grow up, okay? Look at someone close by. You need to grow up. Here's what you do. You are, okay, I'm going to tell you right now, you are going to be tested by God. 
you will get test by God your whole life on planet Earth. You will walk through test. You will be tested by God. You will be persecuted by the enemy, and you will be tempted by the spirits of darkness. These are the things that are going to be taking place. These are the things that are going to happen. Um, you are going to find out that you need to grow up. Why? Because you're going to be tested by God, persecuted by the enemy, and tempted by spirits of darkness. So I want to talk to you about the seven steps of faith, or the seven tests of your faith. You could also say these are the seven seasons you will go through on planet Earth if you live long enough. There are seven things that will happen to every single one of us on planet Earth. And when we accomplish all seven, they will always go to another round of growing in them. These seven trials, these seven tests, these seven growth spurts are absolutely important for you to live in the new and living way. God wants you to realize there are seven tests that you will walk through in your life. And found in 2 Peter chapter 1, flip over to 2 Peter chapter 1. It's really important you get them in your Bible, you mark it in the Bible so when you go back you can read it. Starting at verse 5, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Now I'm reading like Pastor Josh. Number one of the seven tests is virtue. Number one, you will be tested on virtue. The word virtue that you need to understand means good things. What can we do to look at your life and applaud you for those good things? That's what it means. What good things have you done that can be recognized? What good things? They can be very, very little. I am amazed when we're at a public building whether it's a restaurant or some other office building or something, and I'm walking out and I see a lady coming or someone close by, and I stay there and hold the door, leave the door open so they can get by. They, are, they look puzzled. Like, wow. And so they'll say, well, thank you. And they're like, it doesn't happen. But you know, it's a little thing that's a good thing that could be a virtue. Here's why I, I want you to understand virtue in another way. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the virtues of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Same Greek word. Here it's translated praises, that we are supposed to praise Jesus. What did we acknowledge? His big stuff? His big stuff dying on the cross. Big stuff being resurrected. Big stuff feeding 5,000. Big stuff. But you know, there were a lot of times he just held the door open. What virtues in your life? Well, I don't want to, I don't want any praises. Well, you, you need to quit being self-centered. Wait, wait a minute. I'm not self-centered. I don't want to be acknowledged. You're self-centered. It means you think about yourself, and I'm uncomfortable with people acknowledging a good thing that I did is self-centeredness. It's just about you. It's not about Jesus. You are going to have a test on virtue. You are going to have to pass the virtue test. And the virtue test is you got to do good things. Be a good person. It's not hard. And you're in church. You're walking around in the building. And you see a piece of paper on the ground, pick it up and put it in the trash. It's not tough. You, you're on your way out and you realize somebody forgot their communion cup and it's sitting on the floor because they didn't want to go back and throw it away. Pick it up and throw it in the trash. It's virtue. Okay, enough of that. Let's go to knowledge. Knowledge is kind of self-explanatory. It's grown in the knowledge of God. You will be tested on your knowledge of God. How does the test come in your life? How does the season come? It's different for every single human on planet Earth. But God is going to require you to have knowledge. He wants you to know who he is. He wants you to know who you are. And you need to continue to grow. All seven of these tests 
These, these walks of faith are required for you to grow and live the new and living way. The next one is self-control. Under self-control, that is exactly what it means. This Greek word means self-control. Control your anger. Control your temper. Control your behavior. You know, be of self-control. Walk, and you will be tested in self-control. There will be times, and it, it's like, you know, husbands and wives, they go through this test all the time. I know this not because of personal experience. I've just done a lot of counseling. <laughs> perseverance. Perseverance is the, is the phrase for godly patience. It simply means a never give up attitude. Number five, godliness. Most people preach about holiness and what they really mean is godliness. Godliness is godly living. That's what it means to live godly to walk in godliness, to be, be to choose, to do the right thing the God way, living godly. And then uh, your test number six is brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness simply means to be respectful and kind to other believers, even if they are not in complete agreement with you. It's hilarious when you see two Christians, one Republican and one Democrat, I said, wait a minute, where's the brotherly kindness? There isn't any right now. You know, again, you're being tested. Number seven, love. Love. What's interesting about this Greek word for love, it is not agape. Most people would read it automatically. Oh, yeah, agape. Oh, yeah, love. Like, let's go up on a mountain, put a flower in my hair, and, you know, get a little guitar and just love. And no, no. That's not, it's, it's not agape love. This love, and this is a kicker, means to have love for someone or something based on sincere appreciation and high regard. To love, to regard with affection, loving, concern, love. God's test is for you to love things, but not love them more than God. He wants you to love people. He wants you to love. He wants you to experience love. This is an emotion. He wants you to know what it means to love. He wants you to love something. It's okay. Get this. Get this. According to these tests, it's okay to love baseball. It's okay. Just not more than God. In fact, he wants you to love sports or people or art or flowers or cooking or whatever. He wants you to experience love. He wants you to enjoy something. He wants you to enjoy people. Love is part of your spiritual growth. Now, here's the whole thing that you need to realize. You need these seven things. You need these seven virtues, these seven tests, and you're going to pass them. And if you're stuck somewhere in your life right now spiritually, that you've hit a spiritual impasse or a, a you know, you, have, you are just somewhere that you're not making. You found yourself in a cul-de-sac of spirituality. And all you can do is see, you know, and you haven't even turned around to see, well, I can go out the way I came in. But what you need to realize is if you are stuck spiritually, you're probably being tested in one of these seven areas. And you need to pass the test. Because watch what happens, and I'll close with this. Don't you like those words? I'll close with it. It always relieves your butt a little bit. Or if Mark comes up, then you know, okay, whew, he's almost done. Second Peter 1, 8, here's what it says. Now we're same chapter, verse 8. For if, that's a big one. If these things are yours and abound, you will never, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But get this one. Verse 9, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. If you are always remembering your old sins, if you're constantly keeping track of your mistakes, you are failing in one of these tests. You are stuck in one of those areas. You need to get through it need to walk through that, need to pass. It could be brotherly kindness. It could be 
It could be one of the other seven, you know, that we talked about. It could be knowledge. You could be lacking knowledge in that area. It could be a self-control issue. It could be perseverance. But these are the seven areas that will cause you to succeed. Verse 10, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. The Greek could be translated, you will never miss a step. If you do these things, if you add to your faith virtue, so what's the beginning? The beginning is faith. The whole beginning is your belief in Jesus Christ. Now that you believe in Jesus, add to Jesus virtue, to virtue knowledge. And then it goes on and on. Add to it, but purposely add. Add knowledge, add self-control. Examine yourself. Take a self-examination. Take a test. And go in with those seven issues, those seven things. How are you doing in virtue? Are, is there, are, is there anything we can say, well done, good and faithful servant? Way to go. That's a good thing. How about knowledge? Are you growing? Or it's been a long time outside of Sunday that you have ever even read the Bible. Are you growing in knowledge? What about self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love? Do you love anything? Is there anyone, anything that you love? And are you enjoying that love? Because the more you experience love for things and people, the more you can grow your love for God. You need to give yourself to the new and living covenant. And the way it starts is by knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So I speak to you here in the house. I speak to you online. Have you ever asked Jesus to come into your life? Do you know that if you died today, you'd go to heaven because Jesus paid the price? Have you, Jesus, have you ever said, Jesus, I need you? Have you ever said, Jesus, I, I need you to save me? If you've never done it, today's the day to do it. So I'm gonna ask everyone in the house and you online who can, would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes? If you've never asked Jesus into your heart, you've never asked him to come into your life, I ask you to do that right now. Take a moment with your head bowed and your eyes closed and say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, come into my life. Jesus, be part of me. Save me. Father, I thank you so very, very much. I thank you so very much for each person who has said yes to your son. And we receive them into the kingdom of God, into the family of God. We thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Let me close because I just asked you to come to receive Jesus. Look at verse 11 of the same chapter. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You want a big party when you get to heaven? Do these seven things. You want to have this explosive thing happen when you show up in heaven? Do these seven things. You do these seven things, you will be growing in the new and living covenants and you will be received in heaven with a party. In other words, remember the day. The day. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord a Thank big hand? Lord.